this is something that our, our co-chairs and Barry Reese and Marsha Prengruber started the discussion on and laying the groundwork for many, many months ago. So this is an outgrowth of that. And then all the working group chairs, co-chairs were brought in and we have a task force. So we envision this as a series of presentations, panel presentations and discussions with, uh, in, with the subject of integrative clinics. So this is our, our first one. And I'm envisioning it as a conversation. We have a number of questions that, that came up from previous discussions that were sent to the panelists to help guide the conversation. We have a very limited time and a lot to cover, so we'll see where the conversation goes. And with, with this, I, I would like to turn it over to David Fogel, the co-founder and CEO of Casey Health Institute, and Nancy Conway, the Director of Integrative Medicine of Aurora Healthcare in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you both so much for your preparation and for for being on this panel, our first panel today. Thanks. Thank you. Um, how would you like to do this, Beth? So, um, yeah. Why don't we start, David? Why don't Why don't we start with you and then Nancy? And I thought we could. Just have a brief description of your clinic so people have an orientation of, of where you are and what you do, and then we can launch right into the questions. And much as when when you were both preparing for this over our, our lunch in San Diego when we met at the Academy conference last week, I thought just that even the dialogue between you about what, what, you're, what you're both doing and how you approach things was very interesting. So um, if, you, if you like, then just start with a brief description of your clinic, and then we can go right into the first question. Okay. Um, I'll try and do this um, as succinctly as possible. So we are a, um, a nonprofit, integrative, primary care, patient-centered medical home. We um, were started with an initial grant from an angel donor um, with the model to ultimately become sustainable using um, a value-based population health approach to collaborative, team-based, integrative primary care. Um, we recognized we were in a fee-for-service world and uh, unfortunately are still largely in a fee-for-service world and that's one of the things we can maybe talk about. But the intention has always been to use the team structure that the patient-centered medical home has and finesse that with a collaborative, integrative um, medicine team approach Importantly, it's a staff model. We have a lot of collaboration time for face-to-face, -face, electronic, and organic um, uh, discussion between practitioners so that it is truly team-based, not just a bunch of people practicing under one roof. Um, let's see. We have a wide array, uh, we have five primary care practitioners, three docs, a nurse practitioner, and a, um, and a, a physician's assistant, two acupuncturists, we're hiring a second chiropractor, we have a naturopathic physician, we have uh, two psychologists, very mindfully based, we have an integrative nutritionist, a massage therapist, um, and a full-time yoga therapist. I don't think I missed anybody, but I might have. Um, and everybody practiced to, together. We also have a wellness center with a lot of wellness programming. And I think I can stop there. Great, great. Thank you. I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more as we go along. Nancy, how about you? Yes, hello, everyone. Um, I don't have a clinic. Um, I represent a system with multiple services uh, across our hospital system. I work for Aurora Healthcare. It's a private not-for-profit integrated healthcare provider. Um, we service over 30 counties uh, in the state of Wisconsin, and we're the largest employer in the state. Um, with that said, we have 15 hospitals and over 150 clinics. Um, we also have 17 cancer centers. And so we're quite large. 
And the landscape of um, what we've done in integrative medicine is really to integrate our services across the spectrum of um, multiple types of care that we're providing, uh, as well as multiple locations. Um, some people refer to us as the business model as a complex uh, hybrid, meaning that we have vertical model, and similar to what David has expressed, where you have services in one location, um, and then we have services plugged into multiple locations um, independently. So you may have a chiropractic practice uh, within a primary care office, or a chiropractor aligned with a orthopedic surgeon in a spine program, or a massage therapist embedded on an inpatient unit dedicated to provision of uh, inpatient uh, services for cancer patients. So it's a very uh, different approach um, than what they did have. It's, it's quite a contrast. All of this was built on the back of a lot of healthcare. Um, we started with massage therapy and added uh, acupuncture, chiropractic services, and we have um, health coaches as well as uh, fellowship trained physicians and advanced practice providers. Um, we total a workforce now of about 70 employed individuals across the system. Um, and we also have educational initiatives to expand the tools that our current uh, clinicians have. For example, if it's nursing, we have uh, certified clinical and therapy practices, uh, etc. It's quite diverse. Nancy, thank you for all of that. Can you try speaking closer to your mic? Because the, the background noise that we had talked about in you know when we were testing the setup this morning, it's yeah. much louder when you're speaking and it's competing with your voice. So if you're somehow able to get closer to your mic or I don't know if anything's blocking it, but some of what you said was a bit muffled. We want to oh, hear every word. I'm right on top of it. That, if I speak much better. That better? Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, sorry, it's not working as smoothly as, as uh, we had hoped, but, but speaking up and closer to the mic will really help. Thank you. Okay. So we're ready for the, the first question, the, the, the collaboration and referral. And if you want to address uh, the, the however you want to address it, but something that we have in the question is what are some of the processes that you've incorporated at your clinic to facilitate collaboration among providers and how does this sense of collaboration support referrals and anything else that, that you'd like to talk about the subject of collaboration and referral and we'll take 10 minutes for this, so basically five minutes each. Uh, David, I'll go first on this. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, much better. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Um, I can't stress enough uh, the process that we have undertaken here is education, education, and education. Um, we are very well aware that um, we're hiring individuals from their individual disciplines. And even though we've been hiring acupuncturists and chiropractors for the last uh, 15 years, we realize that they're coming from a model or a framework that is individual and unique to them. So we spend a great amount of time on the front end in orienting our providers and cross-training uh, with them and introducing them to a host of other uh, professions within the organization as part of their onboarding process. Um, we've been doing that for years, but in the last several years, we've really been uh, putting together a program that does interprofessional training on how to really maximize the, um, each clinical service to be much more aware of uh, the other practices. And we, we do this by sitting down and doing a deeper dive into the models of care that we want to provide. So for example, um, uh, back in spine related care, we really had to dig into what are the standards that we need to have in place for the acupuncturist, the massage therapist, the chiropractor, the physiatrist, uh, the physician, and the MPs working together in that practice. Um, in addition to that, the collaboration, I think, is supported through, we have, an, we have EPIC as a system, uh, and we have uh, built in a referral process uh, as service to um, a, a technology piece within EPIC so that 
all of our providers are aware of the services that we have uh, within the system. And finally, I think one of the greatest pieces for us is that we've really advanced the number of fellowship trained physicians that we've brought into our system uh, and advanced practice providers. And they're, they're very good at uh, working collaboratively among the integrative uh, therapy professionals as well. And I think that's really helped raise things up among the primary care practices. I have, can we ask questions, Beth, or is it not, uh, do you want to just hear people um, comment? You know, we're in such a time, such a tight time frame, I'm wondering uh, if what the, the panelists and, and everybody would think if we just sort of maybe asked questions after both of them had spoken about question, question and see where it goes. We may or may not get to all the questions, that's fine. Does that make sense? Uh, can I hear from both the panelists and the co-chairs if, if that's where you want to go or if you'd like to take questions during the, the talk? Yeah, hold questions until after they've had the opportunity to respond. Okay. okay. In addition, and this is Jennifer, I may suggest that if people would also like to type in the questions in the chat log, that's something that we could keep a record of and perhaps use for discussion later at the end of the conversation. It's a great idea. Thank you. David, on to you. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I um, have been in, in at least a couple of different settings for, col for collaborative integrative care. The first one was an, was an independent contractor model where um, out, of the, out of passion and, and um, interest in good patient care, people would get together and talk um, amongst the different modalities. But ultimately, that kind of broke down because people there wasn't enough time, and people have families, and they need compensation for their time. And there's a lot of time required for true collaborative integrative care. So when we created Casey, I, I made it a stipulation of, of working on it that it would be a staff model. So I originally thought, OK. We'll shut down the, the center two, two hours a week, and we'll spend one of those hours doing just education. We'll either bring people in or have the different modalities talk about what they do. Level of knowledge comes up, and also um, uh, they can do some kind of questions about whether this would be good for this patient or not. The second hour was much more of a case presentation where you know we would try to get through as many um, different patients and see the different modalities and how they might um, create a team-based collaborative care. Uh, in addition to that, we structured the physical layout of the center um, with a, a centralized team room so that people's desks were in the team room and they filtered through throughout the day and bumped into each other for informal kind of organic curbside consult. Um, again, I, my experience was time was the premium. Um, and um, that wasn't enough. And we've been through many, many conversations with the practitioners. Um, we structured in something that they developed uh, called speed dating where you know, we would sit in a room and two, three practitioners would sit together and talk about as many patients as they could with those particular modalities in mind. And then a, 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 literally a timer would go off and people would rotate. That was good, but again, not, not enough. So we have just recently structured in um, an hour a day um, into the schedule four out of five days in the week um, for collaborative time. And um, that's going to start in January. Um, there's never going to be enough time. And all the modalities, and even our docs who have been trained at, at, you know, in the fellowship in Arizona and have been out practicing for a while, find that they need, they don't just know how to use the different disciplines um, for each individual case without talking about it. Any, I think any more like, you know, I was trained allopathically and I don't, I, it would always be helpful for me if I could sit and talk about 
people in the team. Um, so uh, there's economics. Um, there's economic challenges with that. Uh, I think again, if you're looking at value-based care and population health approaches to to primary care, that on the back end it, it actually makes a lot of economic sense. Finding a way to pay for it and make it sustainable until that whole system falls into place, I think, is the challenge. So those are the main structures that we work. Oh, in addition, our electronic health record, we have spent hours and hours and hours um, templating. And um, everyone has access to the electronic health record and can see um, you know, what's happened at the most recent visit. We also have instant messaging where the practitioners, while they're in, if they're seeing someone else's um, patient, they will actually instant message them in the exam room of the other of a practitioner if they have a question. And if they can answer it, then they will. Uh, again, it's a, it's a key thing. There's never enough time, but I think especially an integrative approach is just um, essential. I think we could spend the whole time talking about this first slide. And uh, David and I certainly had a, a chat when we were in, in San Diego. But I, I just want to echo the fact that um, you know I really think that David has articulated well some of the challenges. Um, his is in a clinic, um, mine is across the system. We have we have an electronic medical record where all of the disciplines come together and everybody can see each other's notes and collaborate and have the instant messaging approach. And um, we talked specifically about the fact that time is money. And having the luxury to take the time uh, is something that we have to do on the front end uh, and do the best job we can. Primary care is one piece, but we're also dealing with specialized populations, such as advancing this level of care uh, into back and spine or in specific women's health areas or oncology clinics, and that's a whole other level of complexity uh, to the referral and collaboration process. Well, fascinating from, from both of you, and thank you for making it so real and so tangible. The question that, that came up is, uh, I think, for, for Nancy, how are you doing interprofessional education and collaborative practice so that your, your people are understanding the depth and breadth of of each discipline? Well, that's a great question. I, I really, <laughs> my people, that, and that's an interesting way to refer to it as well because I really feel in my leadership role that um, all the employees are my people uh, when it comes to educating them about what we're doing in integrative medicine. Uh, but we have several uh, uh, processes in place. We have an electronic education system whereby we can build out um, educational uh, offerings um, and uh, provide CE by clinical discipline for the completion of those things. And they're very, it's a very easy way, kind of static way, to get baseline information. So we'll have some things built out, for example, on what is aromatherapy. And any caregiver across the entire institution can go there and get it free. And depending on uh, their level of, of background, how they certify for CEU or CME. We do multiple um, day-long hour or hour-long presentations. We really hold a variety of them scheduled across the organization. Our latest approach is the biopsychosocial approach to care for therapists and nurses. Uh, again, another example of a CEU-based offering. We'll hold CME events as well. Um, so whether it's a brown bag lunch or a formal presentation or electronic communication, uh, email database, uh, which is the ginormous uh, that we constantly hit over and over and over again uh, to message across the organization. We also have um, a web-based system that communicates to all caregivers called Caregiver, Caregiver Connect, and we have opportunities to put information uh, live on that, on that stream as well. So lots of opportunities. Uh, it just takes a lot of work to get them out there and to hold them all. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank, thank you, Nancy. And, and you're both right. We could absolutely spend many sessions just on question one. So let's look at this as a high-level overview of just skimming the surface. And, and you're doing a great job. Let's move on to question two about hiring practices. And uh, I'll 
either one of you can, can jump in to, to take it on first. All right, let me, I have to read it first. <laughs> Um, well, hiring is an incredible challenge for us. We have been trying to hire particularly primary care practitioners. Um, docs are the biggest challenge, although nurse practitioners and PAs are also challenging. Um, there is a shortage, and so we, uh, we have a waiting list for especially our our integratively trained um, doc, um, and we have had to hire um, people who haven't had formal integrative training um, just so we could provide services, and then uh, create internal training tracks, which we're uh, really focusing on doing now to bring them up to speed. As um, but it, it our our challenges are actually finding particularly primary care practitioners. Um, and this is, you know, we have a, uh, an, a human resources director, and she's been working full time for probably two years, constantly recruiting. Uh, I don't know. Other than that, uh, what practices we found? I mean, I, part of the reason I just went to the academic, uh, I mean, for, to the uh, Academy of Integrated Health and Medicine conferences is to try and recruit docs who were um, integratively trained. But uh, we're we're looking at all avenues to find, particularly integratively trained, but just good, philosophically aligned primary care practitioners. Um, are, are by necessity also what we're, we're hiring. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Nancy? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we have some of the same challenges that David has articulated. Um, we have the luxury of being an integrated medicine department and being well known enough in our institution where now the organization understands that if we are going to recruit a chiropractor or a fellowship trained provider or acupuncturist, uh, we are the go-to person. And it took us years to you know, develop that. But it started with us putting standards in place. So um, we partnered with HR and wrote uh, comprehensive job descriptions outlining what uh, the core criteria was for for hiring legitimate individuals in the organization. And we do have a hiring model. We aren't a contractual model. Um, our hiring model extends to all of our therapies as well as our physicians. Um, in addition to that, we created um, job standards so that there was clarity about expectations when people entered into the organization. And that because we're so geographically diverse, and in that diversity, there's cultural shifts across the state, we had to make it really clear about what those standards of care really were. And a good example of that was, you know, in chiropractic, um, our standard of practice really, uh, the scope is outlined for neuromuscular, neuromusculoskeletal approach to care. And that was really important as we move forward with all of our orthopedic surgeons that they understood exactly what a chiropractor would do uh, if placed in a clinic right beside them. Uh, in addition to that, we do a lot of uh, team interviewing here. Uh, so if we are bringing in a chiropractor, um, we typically have uh, two or three individuals uh, representing uh, not only management but diverse clinical backgrounds interviewing that individual. Um, we have a lot of behavioral interview questions that we utilize to match the culture of our internal organization. And then we partner them after we vet clients, uh, vet incoming uh, resumes and um, professionals. And then we present our candidates uh, to our internal partners. So our process is quite drawn out, but it's really focused on finding the person with the right skill and the right personality fit to match the culture, the unique culture of the environment that we'll be placing the person into. 
Yeah, if I can also say that I, I echo what Nancy's saying about the importance of finding the right cultural fit as well as the right training. We, we also have a very um, extensive and team-based interviewing process um, that is somewhat exhaustive to the people that go through it, but um, to really make sure that, that it, it fits for both parties. And uh, we'll put them into the, the team room to just sit for a while and um, even come in and um, shadow some of the practitioners if it's appropriate um, to, to get a sense of how they are uh, you know, in, the, in more than just a face-to-face -face interview. I think uh, you know that shadowing is a really key piece, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I regret that I did not bring that up. But the hiring practice also extends for us into an onboarding period, and that onboarding period has to be um, really, uh, you know, overseen quite carefully in addition to the orientation process, because a full hire really needs to have um, their hand held for quite a long period of time and, it, and it's expensive and we to find that position turnover is quite expensive. It's um, very labor intensive. So the hire, we put a lot of emphasis into uh, hiring the right person, onboarding them and orienting them and kind of mentoring them uh, to their level of success. That's great. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. It gives us a, a good picture and some good practices. We've already talked a little bit about EHRs, but but let's talk a, a, about it some more. If if you have more to say, what EHR systems you use, David? I believe you started talking about that and what have been some of the challenges you've encountered and what creative strategies have you employed to navigate these obstacles. So anything you can share here would be very valuable. Go ahead, Nancy. Thanks, David. <laughs> well, I can tell you, if you ask any professional in our organization, there is a love-hate relationship around. Whoops, we lost you there, Nancy. So we heard a love-hate relationship around. In, in uh, electronic uh, records. And uh, we have ethic in our um, bring what? Pardon me? Yeah, maybe there's a delay, Nancy, because you had cut off and then come back. So uh, I, I, I just think it was maybe a little went out. But it sounds like you're back. All right. So I said love-hate relationship. Um, but the one thing that Epic has done for us is um, it really treats all individuals equally. So our massage therapists are using the system right alongside the orthopedic surgeons and their brings you know, a better level of understanding about who's getting what service and how it's being coordinated. Um, so I think what our greatest challenge is right now in EPIC is being able to pull the data uh, that we want. And the size of our institution also generates problems for us because we have to go through consistent updates. These are mega updates. And during the time these mega updates take place, we can't get small things done. Everybody's blocked. So while it brings us many, you know, great opportunities to collaborate, it also is um, somewhat of a, it's, it's not a fast-moving process. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Nancy. Okay. Good, good description. So almost I think almost everybody I speak to has a love-hate re relationship with their electronic health record. I think a lot of times it's mostly hate. Um, we went through one, when we opened, we had one EHR that we vetted very carefully, went through a whole RFP process, and, um, and then six months after we uh, signed on and got up and running and had spent a lot of time templating the different disciplines, uh, they they were bought by another company and they sunsetted our product. Essentially, we and, and the product really started to crash relatively frequently, and we lost data. Um, so we we switched to another EHR. We're now in Athena, 
which is a web-based, I mean a cloud-based system, um, which is much, much better. However, I, I'm constantly surprised with how advanced technology is in general, how, how um, difficult it is to do things like pull reports and that uh, to create reports, to pull reports, to, to pull data. Um, and so that remains a, a, an ongoing dialogue with our electronic health record company. Um, also, there are always glitches or updates present a problem because people have to relearn things that you know get reprocessed um, in terms of their, their flows. Um, we've had particular trouble with um, schedule, the schedule templates and that aren't set up for an integrated practice um, and really with workflows and with um, uh, cancellations, all the things that you need, especially in a multidisciplinary setting with multiple practitioners, you need it to be really streamlined. Um, and templating, you know, a, a longer patient visit and then you know follow-ups that are a bit shorter and then acute and um, continues to be something that across modalities as an acupuncturist visit looks different in time and flow and it even varies from acupuncturist to acupuncturist how they prefer versus uh, uh, our psychologist or our chiropractor and so these are things that that we we struggle with with the electronic health record um, in an ongoing way. We, one of the best things we did was um, one of our acupuncturists is very interested in, uh, in IT and so we actually created a half-time position for him to do to help with um, IT and the electronic health record. So he's our main interface with them and um, he understands the clinical side and he understands the, uh, the uh, EHR and IT side of, of things, and that's that's really been a godsend for us. Uh, but it's an ongoing struggle, and it's never what I expect it to be. Uh, I would agree with David. Um, I just wanted to comment on the fact that bringing somebody in that represents your service line, whatever it is that you whatever it is that you have, whether it's an acupuncturist or chiropractor or massage therapist, and somebody can understand and walk within um, the EHR process and be your ethic resource can be fundamentally the best thing that you do. And every person that comes into our organization that we hire gets mentored by him. Whenever we set up a new service, we work very closely with him as he um, works very closely with the smart chart folks to make sure that everything is lined up exactly correct. Um, this is an area where when you make mistakes on the front end, they take um, many, many months to undo. And I would say the other thing that we've learned about this process is it is not nimble, as David represented, but additionally, it's really hard uh, to interface when you're talking about cash-based programs versus insurance reimbursed programs and making mechanisms for that. It's, it's a nightmare. Thank you. David, did you want to say anything else, or should we move on to the next one? Uh, just to, to um, reiterate what Nancy just said about cash-based programs versus insurance-based programs, we actually, in our wellness center, have a separate program um, called MindBody that a lot of, a lot of uh, health or wellness centers use that, um, that helps with that, but then we have to figure out how to, how to pull data from both, and it, it, again, it's not nimble. That's the good word she used. All right, the next question is the role of the patient. It could be surveys, advisory panels, what have you. Patient-centeredness takes into consideration individual preferences, needs, and values, while also acknowledging that patient values shape clinical decisions. What well, can you tell us about how patient experience has influenced your 
listening for program, and do you engage in any particular strategies to elicit information from patients, such as surveys or advisory panels, and what lessons have you learned? Well, I've learned a lot about this. Um, Patient-centeredness kind of has lost its meaning to me. Um, it's a buzzword at this point. Um, and, you know, just talking about a patient-centered medical home, it, a lot of, from what I found, a lot of people just are trying to click off boxes so that they get a higher reimbursement rates but don't really pay attention to, to the patient in, in the spirit of a patient-centered um, uh, structure. So I, um, it, being patient-centered in primary care is difficult, period, from my perspective. Um, and having uh, kind of a, a culture that is integrative and is high-touch and uh, low-tech in some ways and heart-centered does not in any way, shape, or form I have found, at least with us, guarantee that you're patient-centered. It really has to do with workflows and um, making sure that people, that your patients can ha actually have input um, and, and, and soliciting input and then acting on that input is, um, uh, again, a bandwidth problem. There are lots of patient suggestions and complaints and um, being able to address them in a way that they experience as listening to them and putting them at the center of care is um, an ongoing, I think, challenge. Um, that said, I do think that we have been successful at creating re uh, a really nice collaborative, integrative, team-based system that works most of the time. And the patients do experience that their practitioners that they really are, in the spirit of a patient-centered medical home, at the center of their care. Um, but it's much more um, workflow and process-oriented, um, as well as care coordination-oriented. I mean, it's not just about when the patient is in the office. It's in, in many ways about what happens when they're not in the office and how you keep they're care coordinated and keep them in the loop and how they experience that. We do do regular surveys and we have experimented with a number of ways of doing that, shooting it out through our electronic health record. We've done it in real time as they are leaving the, the, um, the, the office. Um, I have started doing um, a series of town halls that we shoot out an email to everybody in the practice that come and just talk talk with me about what your thoughts, feelings, learn about what, how we started, learn about the ad challenges that we're having. Um, and those have been getting more and more popular. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that I think. Uh, just one other quick thing when I see advisory panels. We're talking about an advisory panel and um, I have one patient in particular that's been working with me kind of uh, brainstorming, which it, it's, it's a double-edged sword potentially is that you get an advisory panel of patients who are very engaged and passionate, but if you don't really be, if you're not really careful about who you put on those advisory panels, you can't fire a volunteer patient advisor. Um, so uh, the, the the vetting process is really important. We have two patients on our board of directors. That has worked out really well, but I think we, we did a very expensive uh, vetting process. Okay, I'll stop there. Yeah, those are some, some, great, some great points, David. Thank you. Nancy? Um, well, we are a patient-centered organization, um, but as David said, you know, that's taken on some new meanings. In, in some ways, it's, it's diluted. The terminology is uh, becoming antiquated. Aurora Healthcare utilizes Press Gamey to um, collect data respectively on um, overall hospital-based um, 
um, outcomes as well as uh, provider-based outcomes. Unfortunately, um, a decision was made financially not to include chiropractic, acupuncture, or massage due to cost, even though um, the organization admits that our high-touch services would likely bring about um, better patient um, outcomes. Um, so the scrappy person that I am, I changed the way that I was uh, approaching getting um, patient feedback. So part of what's happened in our organization is um, we've entered into the day of consumerism. And we are now, uh, it, the system is extensively involved in surveying uh, patient populations about uh, their interest in health care. And um, lo and behold, integrative medicine and related therapies are rising up in interest and demand, uh, in part because of the non-drug approaches to care and providing people with choices uh, that haven't been provided before. So um, the consumer surveys, and we have a consumer's insight team uh, within Aurora, does a lot of extensive surveying and feeds that information back to us so that we can do better outreach. But the scrappy side of me, um, and I can do this because I'm a large organization, uh, aligned with um, the service lines that were established. So the large scale service lines of orthopedics, oncology, women's health, uh, the, the main revenue generators for a hospital-based system um, really look specifically at what their patients want. And they have the patient advisory councils, and they have uh, the surveys coming in. And so when they, and a really great example of this is that one of our local hospitals, they surveyed their inpatient cancer population and said, um, what's most important to you? And they gave some options and open-ended questions. And the linear accelerator was on the list. And um, everybody thought they'd choose linear, the linear accelerator. And actually, they chose massage therapy. And so from that day forward, for the last seven years, that hospital is funded inpatient massage therapy for its cancer patients. And I think that's, you know, the reality of how strong that consumer segment can be. Um, well, we also get incredible feedback about the model that we've created now within our cancer services where we embed acupuncture and massage and a volunteer Reiki program and how that sets aside um, our cancer services from other cancer-related services in the local area to the point where patients are saying, I'm telling my friends, when they get cancer, they should go to this clinic because they can get their massage therapy right along with the chemotherapy. So um, that's the scrappy side of me, leveraging integrated therapies, which is not a major service line. We are a service lineette or department. Uh, we strive to be a service line, but have a very hard time competing with the billions of dollars that um, a service line like orthopedics can generate on college. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Let's move on to the, the last question. And I'm, I didn't leave time for discussion, I'm realizing now. So it, it, maybe if people have questions, please do type them in the chat box, and we will see if we can answer them. So let's go on to billing, insurance, and sustainability or credentialing if appropriate, since, since we are running short on time, if, if you could just pick one of them and, and talk about it, and then we'll, we'll see if we have any more questions coming up in the chat box. Can I just, I'd like to pick um, longevity. Um, and I'm, I'm choosing to comment on longevity because okay. we have longevity. Great. Um, we started our department in I started with the department in 1999, and we have built a model uh, of care for a healthcare system that uh, has sustained itself, uh, particularly on the clinical integration side, um, by providing a mixed model of chiropractic services, which has a really excellent insurance reimbursement in the, in the Wisconsin area. Uh, and the, predominant cash programs of acupuncture and massage, and then leveraging the physician model, which also has uh, the fellowship trained physicians, uh, which and APPs, which have excellent insurance as well. 
And uh, a key element for that is we have a host of individuals outside of our rural health care system who begin to rely on us uh, for those insurance uh, covered uh, programs. Uh, if somebody needs to have blood work, they have partnerships, et cetera. Um, so it's a really friendly atmosphere that's been developed between the internal folks and the external folks. So I think we have staying power. Um, I guess that's, I would say it's been reflected in the amount of time that we've actually been in practice and been building uh, since 1999. So I feel like we have longevity and that building and insurance uh, clearly do impact our bottom line. We will never be the largest money maker for Aurora Healthcare, um, but normal primary care until the reimbursement models completely change. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, you sound good. Yeah, yeah okay, good. Um, so sustainability, um, really important. Uh, we are currently not sustainable. We're still um, dependent on our initial grant money. We are certainly moving in that direction, although with a lot of anxiety. And, you know, you, you started out with the election today, and um, this is throwing a lot more uncertainty into our, our um, anxiety of, of sustainability because we are, we are really geared and on a path and believe it makes sense to to capture the the value based model, and um, and I, this is putting just uh, just the chaos of of changing things, which is what um, is at least been said is going to happen dramatically. Um, it, it's going to put our timeline um, for making that transition uh, uh, maybe in jeopardy. We'll see. Um, and uh, we have also continued from the beginning and continue to now look for other um, revenue streams, collaborations, partnerships, um, and we're, we just met with the city of Gaithersburg this morning. We're, we're talking um, uh, to uh, health ways about um, potentially creating a blue zone in Gaithersburg where we're located. And um, anyway, there's a lot of ways that we're addressing it, trying to bridge this gap between fee-for-service reimbursement, which is um, very challenging for us, uh, and getting to population health value-based care, which we think is our strong suit and our business model is based on. Wonderfully, wonderfully said. And yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, particularly impacting what you and others like you are doing. So we, you, you, Nancy and David, you have both done a tremendous job of, of answering the questions and keeping to a really good time. So we do have time left for discussion. We have one question in the chat box asking Nancy if the uh, IPE uh, collaborative practice education is a requirement among uh, the, the, the um, health professionals. Our um, inner professional education is driven right now within our own group, and it is required um, in order to practice in certain areas. So it's, it's self-governing, so to speak. Um, if you want to, an example would be, if you are going to be part of the back and spine program, then you need to complete the interprofessional education approach that we've built out so that you're competent in our views uh, of how um, to make this work. Similarly, if you are going to be practicing as an acupuncturist or a massage therapist within oncology, uh, within the chemo infusion suites, um, you have to complete uh, this interprofessional education, and it really becomes competency-driven care in lives. Um, so that's the limit of it. The interprofessional education, uh, an example of where it would be required, for example, as an extended tool in the toolbox, is a nursing unit wants to adopt a 
wellness therapy on a nursing unit, it is required that the nurse the leader, nurse leader, designated individual, and team members uh, complete the online learning competency before rolling out an aromatherapy program uh, within that cancer with, within that nursing unit. So bigger examples and more narrow examples. Does that answer the uh, question? Yes, can I take it one step further? Yes. Okay, so this is Liza. Thank you both so much. This is excellent. So at a national level, the consortium and the collaborative are actually working on a course that would better prepare both our what we call our discipline, the integrative healthcare disciplines, as well as some of the conventional medicine practitioners. Um, but in essence, focusing on preparing many of our practitioners who are often not trained in hospital settings you know, how to work together collaboratively. And our idea is to have part of it um, online, so for both the conventional medicine practitioners to really learn more about the depth and breadth of our various disciplines, and also then for many of our practitioners to understand the whole environment of conventional medical settings, as well as the depth and breadth of the conventional medicine practitioners, and then also have a smaller portion of it uh, required in person. And we're thinking of it just laying out a lot of foundational issues because we know that um, so many of our clinics and the hospital settings have varying needs. Do you think, what do you think of that general idea? Do you think that's a, a good approach? Because I hear from so many practitioners that graduate from our disciplines, they do not feel prepared. And then I still hear from many of our conventional medicine colleagues they could even learn more about their own, you know, integrative um, clinics and settings. So what do you think of just a, a foundational approach that the national organizations could begin to develop together? Do you think that would have been a benefit to people coming into your clinics? I, I can take that without any hesitation and say absolutely. And. Um, uh, particularly with our challenge of not find it's so hard to find integratively trained primary care practitioners, yeah, that, yeah. and and yeah. and we actually ha used the pilot. Um, uh, we we got in at the tail end for the um, the NCIPH online tool. Um, exactly. That that and um, we are going to make it a requirement um, okay. along with some other training modules. But if there's additional training to that, there absolutely needs to be a baseline. And this is not just for the primary care practitioners. I think all practitioners need to have, at least in a, um, in a setting like ours, they really need um, a platform to practice at a, stand, at a level of care that we agree is our level of care and have the knowledge base that they share. Um, so uh, absolutely. Great. Right. Well, we are going to be calling upon many of our working group members and other individuals who are actually on the ground doing it to help work on the curriculum. So, thank you. Nancy, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I, I guess I would just say that it is required. And, um, you know, we've been working with a variety of other models. Um, we have uh, worked with the University of Arizona on their uh, IMR uh, residency program trying to educate residents of the future. I think that's been really helpful. But um, I think the challenge is, and, and is this sort of not unique just to what's happening in this area? I think it's happening in uh, the other um, allied health world. Um, yeah. in that, um, they, the academic institutions aren't able to keep up with ha what's happening on the front lines. And the models of care are evolving. And the academic institutions are relying upon uh, the healthcare organizations to prepare and train these employees of the future. It's a gap and it's very expensive. And I, I think it's on the integrated medicine and therapy side, it's just echoing what's happening uh, across the spectrum of allied health as well. So I, and sometimes I think, oh, this is so unique to us, but it's really not. Um, but I can say, because I come from a therapy background, one of the things that's been missing between the academic institutions and the um, potential organizations of higher is that there haven't been opportunities for students to actually work in those clinical environments, do internships. 
Um, and I'm talking about doing internships within a medical center setting where you get to see a host of other professions and work side by side and observe them. That's been missing. And I think that's um, some of what's going to be called for as a wave in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you both on that. And, and that's a, a kind of a, a nice way to end because we, we have the clinical working group has actually done a work on the postgraduate training, clinical training and residencies and the, the importance of that. And we'll be disseminating uh, that work soon. So that, it, that, yeah, it's critically important. And so we, we are at our time. We have some wonderful questions in the chat box, which we won't have a chance to address right now. But this, this will be a series of, of, that will be continuing in 2017. Nancy and David, you will both invited back any time, both as uh, participants and uh, as presenters. We really valued your time and sharing your insights. And so I thank you for, from all of us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for being on the call. And I, I think we have to wrap it up. But if we have any other questions, please do send them to me, and, and I will communicate with our presenters. and. Liza's just put something in the chat box that the, the, the course that we talked about, the National Center for Integrative Primary Healthcare, I think I said it right, Liza, correct me if I'm not, but the, the course is available for free to all practitioners in January, so I'll send that notice out as well. So okay. I'd just like to say I'm happy, to, I'm happy to, to come back and talk anytime. We're all in this together, and it's really important. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Nancy, thank you also for, for everything that you, you've done with the, the collaborative and con both of you that you continue to do. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to be involved. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, please, Marsha and Barry, wrap it up. This is Marsha. I just wanted to say thanks so much. This has really been fantastic. Really, really appreciate your time and energy on this. Great. I, I have to echo all of that. It's very well done. It's a great start to this program. Thank you. Thank you, our, our clinical working group co-chairs, members, and our presenters. I will have this recording. I will edit it, and it will be posted on the website, and I'll let you all know when it's up there. So we'll close for today. The clinical working group meets again in 2017, and I will have the schedule out to you all soon. Thank you so much, and I'll stay on the line in case anybody needs anything from me. But otherwise, thank you, and until next time, bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.